So we've been talking a little bit about resources that are necessary or critical for rebellion to be able to take off and help explain how rebel groups operate and behave. And we talked about things like drugs, we talked about gemstones, we talked about sort of social endowments, but I'd like to talk today about small and light arms, which end up being an important, maybe even necessary component of a rebel group being able to challenge the state. And so when we're talking about small and light arms, uh, small arms typically refers to things that like an individual can carry, right? So a revolver or a pistol or a rifle or a carbine, those kind of weapons are small arms, light arms are things that typically one to two people can carry, uh, a machine gun, mortar, maybe even a uh, shoulder fired surface to air missile, uh, like a stinger would sort of fit within that sort of category. And the reason why we, we have this distinction isn't because these are simple weapons or um, you know not deadly weapons. Uh, they very much are deadly weapons. They are not necessarily simple as we can see with a, a shoulder fired surface to air missile, but be what makes these weapons the primary weapons of rebels and of insurgents is that they're easily transported by individuals. And so if I am a rebel and I need to be able to move uh, quickly and hide easily, it's a weapon that I can carry by myself and run off into the, into the jungle or into the mountains with is really important. Um, the ability to move these things across borders and across rough terrain where the state maybe can't control that flow of weapons is really important. States are going to notice if, if you're, you know, shipping in fighter jets, they're less likely to notice if, you know, a handful of AK-47s are smuggled in, in the back of a truck along with some produce. Um, and these things are, are, are fairly cheap. They're easily purchased, as we'll talk about. Um, they're, they're widely in distribution in, in much of the developing world, and therefore rebels can get their hands on them and, and use them in combat. And these weapons are very very different than the kind of weapons that states field, which tend to be uh, much heavier. And even when states do field uh, small and light weapons, in the case of like an infantry soldier, uh, that soldier is augmented in a whole host of other ways uh, in, in terms of technology, right? So there's the actual kit that the, the infantry soldier is, is carrying, whether it's, you know, the backpack or the food or the um, binoculars or the computer or the, you know, drones that help to augment um, uh, reconnaissance support and then ammunition and grenades and um, all of that kit helmets and body armor that come with an infantry uh, soldier that go above and beyond are, are oftentimes part of the standard issue for um, soldiers fighting on behalf of states above and, and then above and beyond that we have sort of the, the heavier support of armored personnel carriers um, and tanks, uh, artillery pieces, uh, air support, whether it's helicopters or fighter jets, there's this, this massive um, capital investment that states make around their soldiers who might be carrying small and light arms. Um, and those heavy arms are, are pretty exclusive to states. They, they are rarely fielded by rebel groups. And they're essential when states are fighting other states that have these kind of heavy weaponry and uh, states plan for how to integrate these kind of weapons systems together and support each other. But when it comes to facing a, a rebel group or an insurgency or a guerrilla force, a lot of these heavier arms are, I don't wanna say useless, but have less usefulness. Um, and so a tank is, is a very effective uh, you know, piece of military hardware, but doesn't do much good against an insurgency where the guerrilla fighter is dressed in civilian clothes, lives among the civilian population, and doesn't attack that tank, right? And so there's no way to easily differentiate who is a combatant from the civilian population. And unless, unless you're willing to engage in barbarism and, and actively, you know, harm the civilian population, Things like artillery and tanks and close air support uh, don't do a lot of good in, in terms of combating an insurgency that will attack at the time and, and place of its choosing. And it honestly doesn't even provide an advantage in terms of mobility, right? Having a mechanized military, uh, the ability to, to ferry soldiers in and out with helicopters because insurgents are oftentimes able to augment their own mobility with uh, you know, just light trucks uh, that can um, move forces very quickly at far less cost and also can blend in and look almost identical to civilian vehicles when they're not being used by an insurgency. So there's this mismatch between the kind of weapons that um, states bring to a fight and the kind of weapons that rebels bring to a fight. And certainly if you're taking the perspective of the state, the international system is flooded with small and light arms. Um, CJ Chivers has a, a great discussion about this in a, a Fresh Air interview where he talks about his book, The Gun, um, where he talks about sort of the, the economics of the 
production of the AK-47 and how they weren't driven by you know any sort of rational market force. It was driven by here are command economies from the Soviet Union and, and Eastern Europe and other uh, Soviet aligned states that are mass producing and stockpiling these AK 47s above and beyond anything that would ever be used in a, in a combat situation to kind of keep these factories operating uh, for political purposes. And as a result, you have millions. Uh, I think he says there's like one AK 47 for every 70 people on the planet. Um, so tens of millions, hundreds of millions, maybe not hundreds of millions, of AK-47s that have been produced. And as a result, um, as they have sort of leaked into broader global circulation, the price has plummeted, where at points in time, you could get an AK-47 in a conflict zone for 15 bucks. Um, that's, that's incredibly cheap, and it, it greatly lowers the barrier for a rebel seeking to challenge the state. Um, this is part of a much larger um, trend in um, in the sale of, of small arms, which is roughly $10 billion you know, every year, but a good additional chunk, uh, about a third uh, on top of that, of about $3 billion, is just the black market trade in, in these kind of weapons. Um, and they move much more easily than the kind of weapons that, that states tend to rely upon, um, heavy arms, artillery pieces, you know, fighter jets. Those are gonna be negotiated and sold through contracts between states, whereas small and light arms move across borders um, almost seamlessly um, and move from conflict to conflict over the course of decades. And so from the government's perspective, uh, these weapons are sort of everywhere. <laughs> they're ubiquitous. They're easy to get your hands on. But if you read what rebel commanders talk about in terms of weapons procurement, they're oftentimes quite frustrated by the process of getting their hands on weapons. And I think that makes sense from the perspective of if, we, if, if a rebel group doesn't do this, they're not going to be able to effectively operate. Um, but there's also um, something that, well, but also the, the acquisition process and the support process for these weapons looks very different if you are a rebel group where you are scrounging up what you can get and what you're bringing together may not match up. And so you may have a wide variety of different types of weapons that require different kinds of um, knowledge about, about how they work to service them and maintain them. They may require different kinds of ammunition and you may not have ready access to that ammunition. And so the ammunition that you have may not fit the guns that you have. And as a result, those guns essentially are useless until you're able to acquire additional ammunition to, to operate those guns. And so there's oftentimes in rebel groups a very strict um, control structure around um, what weapons get used, who uses them, the ammunition that, that is provided to those um, those combatants when they're using those weapons, um, and in disciplined rebel groups, uh, that's that's very tightly controlled. Um, it also means that it's harder to train on them, and so rebel groups frequently um, struggle to build basic marksmanship skills on the part of their their combatants. And I, I had a former NRA trainer in my class once I made this point afterwards he came up he's like ah I could teach anybody how to use you know an automatic weapon in about five minutes and I was like okay yeah you can um but CJ Chivers who's been in a variety of combat settings has ob observed that rebels consistently shoot over the top of uh of, of him. He's been in, in dozens of, of ambushes and that first shot from an AK-47 sort of pushes back and pushes the barrel up and the bullets fly wide of their mark because in order to use weapons effectively in a combat setting requires training, it requires discipline, it requires an understanding how those weapons work and you don't get that by just having sort of a I can you know figure out where to to put the bullets and, and where to pull the trigger it requires actual practice and that's hard for rebel groups to do because they don't have the kind of ammunition supplies that's necessary to make that actually feasible. Um, okay, so I like typologies. Um, if you watched any of these videos, you, you know that I like typologies. And so this is one um, that was developed by a guy named Andrew Marsh um, to thinking about different patterns of weapons acquisition and the different kinds of insurgencies or rebel groups that emerge because of that. And so he um, thinks about that in terms of sort of what that acquisition process looks like and the kind of groups that you get and then tries to sort of step back and understand well why do we see these different acquisition processes and so he, he contrasts sort of three case studies and so he contrasts a, a case study involving uh, Maoist guerrillas in Nepal um, and this is his single armed group leadership um, controls the acquisition of weapons and so in the case of Nepal um, the very first attacks that this this guerrilla uh, group 
waged were with knives and they, they attacked police stations and looted the weapons and every single one of those weapons was you know a, a prize capture and was controlled and, and negotiated who would be using that weapon um, where would they be using it and, and, and as a result the groups leadership had very strong control over the operations of the group um, as a function of they're the ones who control those weapons. In other situations, and here Marsh talks about Afghanistan, you have weapons that are sort of flowing to warlords who, or regional commanders, who then sort of equip their, in, their own fighters. And so what you get there is multiple different centers of power, this warlordism pattern. Um, and he contrasts that again with the insurgency that emerges in Iraq and how after the fall of Saddam Hussein, the armories of the Ba'athist army had been looted and weapons were just sort of flooding throughout Iraqi society. And so the way that rebel groups were formed is that people would, would sign up, they would join, and they would bring their own weapon. And because people were bringing their own weapon, it created a ability to break away to join with five or six other folks who had brought their own weapons and form a new militant group that maybe isn't as, as controlled uh, by any sort of central authority because that central authority isn't controlling the guns. And so Marsh's thesis is the level of fractionalization that you get within a rebel group is a function of the level of control the command leadership has over the acquisition and dispersion of guns. And that that in turn is a function of what's going on within society that when guns are ubiquitous in society, um, that you're gonna get these diverse fractured bands because rebels are gonna be expected to source their own weapons. Whereas if you have access for the group um, or for the, to the leadership, whether that's a warlord or whether that's a centralized group to weapons, but the rest of society doesn't have access, then you're gonna have a, a leadership cadre that's gonna have actual control over their organization and it'll be a more disciplined and unified um, situation. Of course, if that disciplined leadership cadre can't get their hands on weapons, well, you're not going to have a insurgency take place until that, that happens, until they come up with a plan for acquisition. So Marsh has sort of this thesis, and I, I'd encourage folks to read his article. It's a really interesting article, and he, he does great work with these case studies of Nepal, Afghanistan, and um, Iraq in sort of contrasting how that acquisition process plays out in terms of, of the group organization. Um, but I'll, I'll finish up this conversation by noting that states have tried to respond to the flood of uh, small and light arms, at least from their perspective, in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, about a decade and a half now, um, the UN uh, helped negotiate a treaty on the illicit trade of small arms and light weapons and all its aspects that would allow for states to limit the transfer of small and light arms across borders um, to try to crack down on that illicit trade. Uh, the U.S. really undercut that agreement pretty significantly, um, pushing back against basically anything that would prevent the private sale or the commercial sale of small and light uh, arms. The Bush administration was particularly vocal in this that um, I'm not sure that this is constitutionally correct, but they argued that the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution meant that the U.S. could not restrict the sale of weapons to individuals around the world. Again, I'm not sure that that actually holds up when you look at practice of um, artillery and tanks, uh, but certainly that was the argument that was made, is that the United States is not gonna restrict um, its gun manufacturers from selling weapons um, where they wish. There have been other conventions and other treaties and other frameworks that have tried to control different weapons. So uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a great deal of concern about the conventional stockpiles of small and light arms that the Soviet Union and other states had, had acquired over the years. And so the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, put together a, a plan and a framework for trying to, to manage and secure those stockpiles. Um, likewise, there have been regional treaties. Um, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, set up a regional ban to try to um, prevent small and light arms from flooding across borders and moving from conflict to conflict um, in West Africa, which was certainly a problem in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s. So there's been a variety of efforts by states to try to control the movement of these weapons, um, and it, these efforts have been a varying success over the years.